Welcome into the 14. I'm your host, Chris Lee, alongside Blake Lovell. I know we had teased a possible baseball show. We are probably going to put that off a couple of days. Uh, Frankly, we're waiting for our man, Barry Allen, to get a mic shipped to him. The audio (laughs) quality in our baseball podcast was not what we wanted. Uh, That's our effort to fix that. So we are waiting on the mail to arrive, which in the Deep South these days is a little bit of a treacherous proposition as I sit here just south of Nashville looking out at, I don't know, four inches of snow and ice and 10 degree weather. And I think that's probably the conditions for a lot of people in our listening audience today, Blake Lovell. Yes, it is indeed. And uh, yeah, I think we're both kind of in the the same range there in terms of uh, what we've seen here from the uh, the winter weather. And yeah, I think uh, probably the shipping and the uh, the deliveries uh, probably going to be a del- delayed a little bit, but uh, that's all right. We'll get Barry hooked up, and uh, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. As you said, I know you guys have a lot of exciting stuff uh, in the works for our, our baseball preview. You're a dog owner, right? I am. Is it unusual for a dog not to want to come in in 10 degrees and snow? Not for mine, because he is, uh. a, he is a husky, and um, little did we know when we got him, he he loves it. Like he would stay out there uh, a very long time. So uh, yeah, this is this is his zone here. So it's uh, it's not ideal for those uh, trying to go out and and to get him in when he's uh, barking uh, at about 10 p.m. and uh, just having a lot of fun out there. So yeah, well, mine's an 11 month old Shih Tzu, and he thinks he's a husky. <laughs> yes. Well, it's uh yeah. Let's just say that uh, the winter weather he, he hates the the, the summer. Like the uh, the summer is just he wants no part of it. But uh, when it gets cold, he is out there uh, as much as he can be. So, yeah, Oreo is a little bit the same way. I, I think he likes the winters better than the summer. I like the summers better than the winters, but it's fun when we get some snow. And you know what's also fun? When we get into crunch time, and by goodness, we are here. This is where the games really start to matter. And let's start here. Uh, the weather. And certainly COVID may have influenced some schedule changes. If you are going off an old schedule, uh, you may want to listen here because a lot of things have changed. I'm going to give you the SEC hoop schedule for the week. Missouri at Georgia, that is going to be 7 Eastern. That'll be on the SEC network. That game's Tuesday. So is Florida at Arkansas. That's on ESPN2, 7 Eastern. Uh, There's no change. That is the originally scheduled time and date for that one. Wednesday, Vandy and Kentucky play at 7 Eastern on the SEC Network. That one is no change. South Carolina and Tennessee, however, those teams were supposed to play Tuesday. That is now 9 Eastern on Wednesday on the SEC Network. Thursday, Alabama going to Texas A&M. That on the SEC Network. I mean, I hope they play that game, Blake. Uh, We never know with the Aggies. That is supposed to be on the SEC Network at 3 p.m. Eastern, so that's an interesting one. You have Mississippi State at Auburn on ESPNU, 5 Eastern on Thursday. That one was scheduled for Tuesday. And then LSU at Ole Miss, that at 5 Eastern on Wednesday, or excuse me, on Thursday. That was moved from Wednesday, that one on the SEC Network. So lots of moving pieces in the SEC hoop schedule this week. Yeah, like you said, it's um, it's hard to keep up with. We've talked before on the podcast about how hard it is to try to figure out who still has to play who and um, what games are going to be made up and rescheduled and all this. But definitely this week, uh, yeah, just having all the the moving parts and, and trying to know exactly um, how it's going to look. And I know, you know, for the teams that are playing on Thursday, um, you know, that's that's a little different because now, you know, you've still got games scheduled for, for Saturday and having to turn around and play pretty quickly. I know that's something that uh, Nate Oates brought up in his press conference on Monday. And so uh, things like that you have to keep in mind now because, uh, you know, usually we get Tuesday, Wednesday games in the SEC. But now for those teams that are playing on Thursday, like in Alabama, um, like in LSU, Ole Miss, teams like that, um, they, they have to turn right around and get ready to play uh, pretty soon after. So I followed SEC hoops for decades. I don't ever remember a midweek afternoon tip-off. I mean, other than the SEC tournament, right? Yeah. Or I, maybe something during the holidays. But this is a first 
that I can remember. Yeah, I think so too. I was thinking about that last night when they they put the times out. I was like, mm, I don't remember any of those. Like I said, I mean, we've we've seen Thursday games before. We've seen, you know, I, until finally I think they realized that just doing it that way, you know, I can't remember how long it's been, but you know, we've had Thursday games and teams turn around and play Saturday and and that before, but I don't remember any that have kind of just been, you know, midday early afternoon type games uh, for any any situation, so all right, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What is Blake's midweek rock fight game of the week? <laughs> or maybe well, just midweek rock fight. That might be a better Well, term. We've got to come up with some terminology here that works. Well, I think that when you think about this, uh, we talked about the offensive struggles of one uh, Tennessee, and they get ready now to play South Carolina. And I think that could be one that could be a little bit ugly. From that standpoint, because uh, we've talked about it, I mean, the Gamecocks have just really been up and down, and and I don't think there's really been, you know, a lot of consistency uh, for them. Uh, So I think that's the game that probably has the best uh, chance of of hitting the under there because uh, Tennessee's offense, as we said, kind of is what it is. And and you know what you're going to get from a Frank Martin team. Like, they're they're not a great team, but I think the style they play, um, it's still going to be tough. I think for Tennessee probably to score uh, the way they want to score probably on them. Um, you know, usually I think we see teams like Ole Miss that use their defense to kind of control games, uh, ones like that. But playing LSU, I think that could be a little bit of a different sort of game in terms of style and how that plays out. So uh, the the rock fights uh, of the midweek games, uh, probably Tennessee, South Carolina is the one that uh, if you love a lot of points, I would have to imagine that that's probably one that you look at and say, eh, I'm not so sure exactly uh, how that could play out. But then again, I think uh, another contender could actually be Kentucky and Vanderbilt, which um, that that could also be one that, that maybe is not exactly pretty uh, just based on what we've seen from Kentucky at times. So. I'm going to push back a little bit. Uh, do we really know what we're getting from South Carolina this year? I, I, I mean, usually yeah. that applies. I think this year's different. Well, I mean, I think just for them, it's, I, I don't know. Like, if you look at how they played, like, they, they they haven't played great on the road, but I think we have to remember, too, like, they haven't played a ton of road games when you just consider that they've still only played 14 games at this point. They won that game at Florida, but I just don't know. Like, it's, I honestly, like, I think it's more Tennessee than South Carolina. Like, I just do not know what we're going to get from Tennessee at this point when they step out on the court, and, and I could definitely see a game to where, you know, if they are not, you know, like we said before, if, if Ponds and John Fulkerson are combining for seven points, then I still think this is one of those games where, where Tennessee is really going to have to put it together because I just said it. Like, we saw what South Carolina did when they went to Florida a couple of weeks ago. So, I mean, similar situation to me. And so I, I don't know what this is going to be. So, See, I think Vanderbilt and Kentucky, that's not where I would have gone because those two teams played – a month ago, that was 77-74 Kentucky. Vanderbilt is going to generate some offense most nights. Kentucky is a little iffy, but Vandy's defense isn't very good. The one I'm thinking, a natural to me, is A&M and Alabama. And I know that A&M, or excuse me, Alabama can score some points, but you look at A&M, I'm looking at Ken Palm right now. Conference-only offense, 88 points per 100 possessions. That is 8.3 points behind Mississippi State, which is next to last in conference games. And then you go, of course, to defense Alabama, allowing 90.2 points per 100 possessions in league games. We talked about how Alabama's defense is number one in the country. Well, A&M's offense is even worse at scoring (laughs) than Alabama's defense is good at defending. Yeah, I think that one, um, and and we, I think we've talked about the, uh, the, we made that on the last episode, but the the research for teams that have had those long pauses, I think A and M could come out and really struggle here because we have seen it to where when you have the long layoffs, like you know a couple weeks, and I think you know like Iona was probably the one that was kind of been the outlier because you know they came out and really just played well in that first game after being off for what was it, fifty one days something like that. But I think for the most part, the data sort of supports that when you have these long layoffs, you're going to come out and, and probably be at a several point disadvantage right off the bat. And like you said, for a Texas A&M team that struggles to score, probably not ideal uh, going up against a team like Alabama. So, Yeah, A&M's last game was January the 30th, beat Kansas State 68-61 on the road. That was SEC Big 12 challenge weekend. But yeah, I mean, it's it's... 
I wonder what because I've not heard any more about the league efforting to get more games in. I mean, we saw some of that this week, but I'm very interested to see what that week between the finish of the regular season and the start of the conference tournament looks like. I've not heard a word on that. Have you? No, I've tried to figure that out too. And and that's what I said. Like when we were just doing it on the fly, trying to figure out who still has to play who and all that, I have no idea exactly what the plans are in terms of scheduling, because I think if you're them right now, you're thinking, okay, well, at this point, we probably have to assume that there are still going to be games that have to be postponed or rescheduled, um, given that we have four or five regular season games left for most teams. Um, so you're you're probably thinking, okay, well, we we know we still have to balance these around. So you know, adding the the Ole Miss LSU addition like that made sense. Um, I think why they did that was certainly something that that, that makes sense for for all parties involved. Um, and now I think it's probably just figuring out, okay, how do we get these games in? And, um, you know, I, I don't know exactly how they're going to do it because, again, I think they're probably just going on the assumption right now that there are still going to be games that probably get postponed. And so um, trying to, to move all those pieces around, I'm sure, is not an easy thing to do. Okay, I want to go back to the concept of the rock fight for a second. A rock fight, by definition, is not a game that you're really necessarily – excited about watching is that a fair way to put it uh, here's what i would say i think the rock fight of the sec campaign thus far is the old miss 52 tennessee 50 like that's what i would classify as the rock fight so i think games like that that are a real struggle um for probably more so for people who love offense like also i mean look we there a lot of people appreciate good defense like but i think when you have a game like that, that's what I would probably throw in there because, uh, again, I think the majority of people want to see points on the board. So that's what I would use as the ultimate example, even though I don't think there's any games on the schedule this week that are going to hit that point. So, You know how Bill James has game scores for baseball, for yeah. pitchers? Uh, you get like a point for a strikeout or, or whatever it is, and it's, it's designed as a quick method to – assess a pitcher's effectiveness or dominance. I think we need to come up with a rock fight index. <laughs> there's there's got to be something like that because, I don't know, there, there's there's something we can do with that because, uh, I mean, for the most part, like, I feel like the SEC, like, you have some good offensive teams in here. I mean, if you just look at, like, Ken Palm and stuff like that, there's some good offenses. But I think the thing is, too, and, you know, that's why some of these teams have success, is there's some really good defensive teams in the SEC. And so sometimes, you know, they can kind of uh, counterbalance each other, and uh, you, you get some of those lower-scoring sort of grind type of games. But I will say this, too. I think the, the fouling is also something that uh, leads to some of these games like that because – we talked about sort of the, the free throws in the SEC and the number of foul calls over the years. I, I spent so much time, probably two or three seasons ago, documenting just how many fouls were called each game and what the average you know free throw attempts were in the SEC for each game, for each team. And it led the nation by far. So I think that's something, too, that can contribute to the rock fight. Uh, instead of calling it the free throw fight, uh, we're calling it the rock fight. But I think that that plays into it as well. So. Okay, I think we need to ask our listening audience for help on this, and they can tweet at us or, or whatever. But I, I'm thinking elements of a rock fight would be lots of fouls. Yeah. Probably excessive turnovers. I think that's fair, yeah. Yeah, lots of missed shots. Um, yep. And to, to be fair, that there would be games where there will be a high volume of shots. I think there needs to be a threshold like field goal percentage under 40. Yeah, or, or free throw percentage under 65 or something like that. Uh, and we should come up with the rock fight score. I, I think this would be great. It, it might actually boost interest in watching rock fights, a, a game that you might turn off. You might keep on to see uh, wh where this scores on the rock fight index. You know, I was looking at or, the— Or maybe I need a life. <laughs> well, I'm looking at the box score from the Ole Miss-Tennessee game, which, again, I'm using as my basis because— there was just a stretch in there where there just were not very many points. But again, I think you have to remember that both these teams are two of the better defensive teams. And so the way they played, I don't know if it was that surprising. Like, I'm looking at the fouls. Like, I mean, 30 free throws in the game, not a ton. 35 total fouls in the game. Um, I guess that maybe is, I don't even think that's like over the top high. Like, we've seen many other games uh, like that. But I don't know. Like, there's just, there's some elements. Again, I think it's, for me, I don't care, but I think for a lot of people who who want 
good offense and like that's just kind of what we got conditions to see like like the Alabama style of play like I feel like that's how everybody wants to see their team play whether it's it's fair or not um everybody wants to see their team get up and down the court have very low offensive possession links and just try to score 100 every game um and I think you know that's why we've kind of determined it when real when in reality I think it's probably just teams that are playing good defense or again in in a, some cases it's um, where you just have a lot of fouls being called uh, because the SEC has gotten that that label, I think, over the years. It's just a, a league where there's a lot of fouls called. There's a lot of free throws. Game times have gone from, you know, an hour and 55 minutes to two hours and 15 minutes or more. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that we were kind of logging several seasons ago, even the past, even last season. Um, and it just kind of became something where you see a trend and you're like, man, um, maybe that, that also factors into the rock fight, I think, because uh, some of these games can be a grind, not for anything that the two teams actually do on the court. It's just fouls and free throws. And it's just, oh, it, it can, it can be a grind sometimes. Okay. I'm looking at the box score from Tennessee Ole Miss. Ole Miss shot. 39.2% that day. Tennessee shot 35.6. From the foul line, Tennessee shot 62 and a half. Ole Miss shot 64.3. Turnovers, Ole Miss had 17. Tennessee had 16. So, I mean, I think this was more of a slow pace. I mean, it, look, it was ugly, right? Not, not good shooting, but it would have been worse than you – some of these numbers that I'm calling out, probably you would have thought they were worse than they were. Yeah. Um. I mean, 39% shooting is it's ugly, but it's not 29%, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> um. Fouls in that one, 17 for Tennessee and uh, 18 for Ole Miss. So, I mean, I, I think that there are some elements – of rock fighting there. I think technical fouls and flagrant ones, that's got to go in there too, right? Yeah, we'd have to put that in there. So I think there's a lot of elements to go into this, the science that we're creating here with this, uh, the rock fights. But um, for the most part, I think the SEC is, has not had a ton of those. It's just, um, I, you know, I think sometimes we just, I, I don't know, some of these games, like you said, you watch them and um, it's just that they're, they're different. But uh, again, I, I think that Tennessee Ole Miss game, I'm probably unfairly labeling it, but uh, I, I'm just trying to do this for the for the offensive lovers out there because I know people love to see points on the board. So we're just classifying games like that that not only have low scores, but uh, also have situations where it becomes a free throw shooting contest or turnovers or just not good shooting. And I think that's what uh, a lot of people have kind of used is the, the, the terminology on social media. Maybe that's where I'm adopting this from because I see the word rock fight a lot when describing uh, some games in the SEC. So, that, so that's where we're taking this from. We're, we're not coming up with this on our own. So, Yeah, I think, I think we're here to quantify rock fight. That should be <laughs> one of our immediate goals of the podcast. We quantify as much as we can. I think number of possessions – yeah, it's got to be in there too, like a you know certain number under sixty five or whatever. But yeah. help us come up with the rock fight score. That, that's your challenge <laughs> to our audience. Yes, um, to to keep <laughs> to keep something that is not interesting, otherwise interesting. But in all seriousness, I will say this: I think the quality of basketball has improved markedly over the last five or six years, and a lot of that does have to do with officiating. I, I think that five, six, seven years ago. College basketball, and in the SEC in particular, just got hard to watch because there were so many things allowed, like hand-checking and bumping and things. They have done a lot to clean up the game, and you're seeing a lot more games in the 70s and the 80s, and you know Alabama got to 115 this week, and I, I don't know that that's a hallmark of great basketball, but I think when basketball starts to get played in the 70s and 80s on average, to me, that's when it is – an eminently more watchable product than when games are typically in the fifties and the sixties, which seem to be the case, like I said, a half dozen years ago. Yeah. And I, I don't know how much of a, I mean, there, there's certainly some crossover, but you know, I don't know what the percentages of, of college basketball fans the, for specific teams in the sec. If we just narrow it down to this group, you know, what's the crossover with the amount of people that watch sec basketball and the amount of people that watch the NBA. Um, because I, I think, you know, in the NBA, you're so used to seeing these 125 to whatever like type scores. And then when you see some of these games, you know, in college, I, I think you can, for whatever reason, again, we, we just like more, right? We just want more, 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 whether it's points, whether it's, you know, anything else, like we just, we want more of it. And so I think that's something that, that goes into it. But I, I agree with you. If you look at just the numbers in terms of the SEC, 
I think this season actually you there are still problems I think with the number of fouls that are called at times but I think this season it has been a little bit smoother than we've seen in recent years where I think it just got to an extreme in terms of foul shooting number of fouls being called I mean again there were times over these past several seasons where I can remember literally going through documenting every single SEC game on a particular game night and saying all right there were 64 free throws shot in this game. There were 42 fouls called. Um, and this was like, this was the trend. This was not something that was just an outlier. There were a lot of games. There were other games where we're getting up to 75 free throws, stuff like that. I don't think we've had a ton of those this season. Uh, I'm sure if you're listening and you're a fan of your particular team, there's probably games you can remember where a lot of them have been shot. I just don't think that number's been as high as it's been uh, in recent years for whatever reason. I have no idea, but um, I do think, you know, for a while there, and, and I still think to a degree there there are issues, but um, I think for a while there, the SEC just became the league that everybody turned to and said, my goodness, this league is becoming very hard to watch, not because of the talent on the floor, because it's as good as it's been, uh, but it's just a matter of games just slow to a halt because you're shooting free throws, you're getting fouls called on every time down the floor, um, and that's not an exaggeration. Like you could actually go through and watch games and say, "Oh, mark an X." There it is again. Like it's just, um, I don't think it's as bad this season, but that has been a problem over the years. Well, I'm looking at Ken Palm's offensive numbers for the league over the last several years. And here's some good examples, okay? This year, like Kentucky, not considered a particularly stellar offensive team, but the Wildcats averaging exactly 100 points per 100 possessions in league play. And Kentucky is one of, I believe, nine teams that is averaging 100 or more per 100 possessions in conference play. And and just barely behind them, Missouri, Ole Miss, and Tennessee, which averaged 99 and change per 100 possessions, followed by Mississippi State at 96.3. You go back to 2013, and you had five teams averaging over 100 points. You had another uh, three or four or five right in that 97 to 98, 99 range, Uh, and then it dropped off Mississippi State 85.6 at the bottom. So you look at this, uh, 2014, it starts to get a little better. Uh, 2015, it does. But you go back and compare this to some of these years we have in the past. I I do think you are seeing a more palatable game, I I think, in terms of how most people like to watch. Yeah, I I agree. I think that's just, again, it's it's where it's gotten to now. And it just feels like it's a much better product for for the most part i'm still going to hold on to the you know the sec and kind of and i don't know what the 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 reason is for that i mean i I think a lot of people have pointed out you know it's a it's a league where and i've said this before the sec historically is usually a league where you get a lot of your points from guys that are not shooting a ton of threes in terms of just overall as a league the sec percentage wise has not been a great three-point shooting league And so there have been a lot more opportunities for fouls in the paint. You've got guys driving to the rim a lot more, and that results in more free throws. So I think that plays a part in it too. But just how the game is called and, you know, adding the hand checking and all this other stuff, um, that has played a role too. But uh, it is, I mean, it's just um, I think the game changes, you know, every now and then. And and we've seen kind of some changes over the years here recently with the, you know, extended three-point line. Has that led to more teams, you know, trying to score inside the arc? As they adjust to it, I, I don't know. And I, and I think there's just a lot of elements that go into things like that. Well, I'm looking at the Ken Palm ratings for the league compared to the other conferences. And, and efficiency, I guess this is scoring efficiency, SEC ranks 16th, which is about as middle of the pack as you can get. And shooting has not been great. 22nd in effective field goal percentage. And there are 32 conferences. Uh, turnover's 28th. So I guess there's been some effort exerted on the defensive end or play is sloppy. Take your pick there. Probably the truth is in between. But what is interesting, the league is number two in tempo overall, and that's not been yeah. really a hallmark, I think, of SEC basketball recently, Blake. No, it's um, it's gone up. And, you know, adding, I think adding in, um, you know, Nate Oates has, has helped that because of his style. I think adding in Eric Musselman has helped that. They play up and down. Um, you know, and, and we've always said, and, and I always go back to the South Carolina thing because people have always, you know, we've looked at Frank Martin and thought his teams, you know, do play that rock fight style where it's a lot of defensive grinding games, but they play, you know, as fast as anyone. And so I think you're just, you're seeing a lot of those different elements 
that are being added in. And, you know, Kentucky has started playing faster. Um, we know Auburn wants to play fast. Georgia, I think Tom Crean, him coming in, they've played faster. So really, I think the influx of these new coaches we've seen over the past couple of years, um, that's been a big reason for it because they have been guys that have come in and said, hey, you know, we're turning things all the way up to, to the top gear. And, and that's what we've seen from programs like that. So. Well, to quantify that, that's about a four-possession per game difference over what it was three and four years ago. You go back to 2018, the league ranked 22nd nationally, 68 possessions a game. This year, that number again second uh, and 71.8. So um, I I don't know. Sometimes just a possession or two can boost you up four or five spots in the rankings, and I don't know that it's – that discernible when you watch a game when you go from 70 possessions to 71 but you you move up three or four and I think you start to notice and again when I watch the game it seems to be a lot more palatable now than than it was like I said in years past now I think the thing that's interesting with this league again not a lot of great shooters in this league like you've seen now you have some scores but I think the three-point marksman you know, the, the the Shane Fosters, the Chris Loftons, the John Jenkinses, uh, kids like that that have really dotted the landscape of this league and have been some of the more fun players to watch. You just don't see a lot of those guys. I mean, when you say who's the top three-point shooter in the league, I don't know that anybody really jumps off the page and comes to mind. Yeah, if you, and you know, I'm sure some of our listeners have this, but if you're like us and you have Ken Palm, the one way you can go through and look at this, and then I always, did, I did the I did the big article on this, I think it was last season, or maybe it was the season before, but just looking at the SEC and comparing it as a three-point shooting league in terms of, um, you know, where the points come from, and, and I was doing this in addition to the fouling. I was trying to figure out, okay, what plays a role here in as many fouls are being called in a lot of free throws? And I think one of the reasons is the SEC has just not been a good three-point shooting league. Like, for example, if you look this year, the SEC, and this is, you know, in conference games only, this is Ken Palm, it has a little thing on the left there um, where he has all those different stats. He talked about tempo and that. He's got three-point percentage where the SEC right now, I think, is shooting 34%. That's 17th compared, you know, when ranking it within all the other conferences. If you go back over the years here, like last season, 28th, year before, 23rd, um, if you go with the year before that, 28th, and so on. Like, I went back through a long way until as far as I think Ken Palm's numbers went, and the SEC is just traditionally overall as a conference. There may be some good shooters here and there. You may have the Shane Fosters, the Chris Loftons, guys like that. But overall, it has been a league that percentage-wise has not shot great from three, and so I think that has sort of changed things a little bit too in terms of, you know, there's more physicality, there's more contact and and maybe that has played a you know a role in some of that too but um there, there are so many different aspects and that's why you know both of us of course find ken Bob fascinating because numbers like that you can really dive in and see we, we've talked about changes here in the league and kind of the different styles but you can really look at numbers like that and kind of see how the league has evolved over the years uh because it, it really is something where there there are some pretty significant trends uh, that have changed kind of how the sec plays i think as a whole well, I could not have named the top three-point shooter in the league without looking. By the way, it's Javante Smart, who's 43.8%. Yeah. But the interesting thing is you look at the league in terms of you've got to have enough shots to qualify in their three-point shooting standings. They only list three guys. <laughs> yeah, And that's that's Smart, John Petty, and A.J. Lawson. And, and no offense to John Petty, but he's not a guy that you think of across his career is a superior marksman, and, and A.J. Lawson, frankly, probably the same thing. Not that they're bad players, and you see this happen a lot of times. Players, as they get to be juniors and seniors, start to shoot the ball better. Not uncommon, but again, it does go to show you, we haven't really talked about this, but as I, as I dig in, there's not elite shooting in this league, and I think that this year, in terms of identifiable three-point marksmen, it's about as bare cupboard as I can remember. Yeah, and like I said, I, I had no idea either on the, the numbers in terms of if you would have asked me, you know, if I'd have said who who would I think would be the leader, I probably would have said John Petty because I, I just would have thought about okay, Alabama's, you know, they're they're good as they are. They score a lot of points. Uh, he's probably someone that's right there at the top. And I'm sure as you dig deeper into it, you can probably figure it out. But you know, I, I think that's an element too. And you know, we spent a lot of time talking about Vanderbilt on, on Monday's episode of the podcast, but 
I mean, they've got, you know, they've got guys that shoot a nice percentage, but they're not making a ton of threes. And and really, when I think back to a team like Vanderbilt and the success they had, um, you know, at times and being able to stay in that top tier in the conference, uh, really, Chris, like, what was the one thing that seemingly always separated Vanderbilt? It seemed like it was their three point shooting. And, you know, they had guys like Shane Foster and um, you can go on down the line. Like you can go all the way back to, to Dan Lange and Drew Maddox and Sam Howard and like all those guys like that. I feel like that was something John Jenkins, like they're just, those were the guys that I think helped them in some of those areas. And so if you're a team in the SEC, like a Vanderbilt, that's trying to make that climb back up, as we've just talked about with these numbers, one thing that could really set you apart is having a guy like that, that can shoot three at such a high level. And if you can get a couple of them even better, um, because that is something, because this league as a whole just is not a great three point shooting league, uh, just from the numbers perspective. So I always think that's something that, that can be a real big X factor on some of these teams. And sometimes that's really all you need to kind of give you that boost to win a couple, maybe three or four more games. And, and we know how big of a difference that could be in a league like this. Yeah. Vandy's a great example because some of those vintage Kevin Stallings teams would put three, four guys who could shoot the three on the floor yeah. at, at once. You know, they, they had bigs who could shoot it at times. Luke Cornett would be one, yeah. although that's a little bit after the range I was thinking about. But And you go back to Kentucky, okay? Uh, Kentucky's best team, I, I think, of the last decade was the national title team. Uh, Coach Cowell's only one. Yeah. And you look at that squad, and I, I remember Darius Miller being such a, a great weapon on that team. You know, and he only was a 38% three-point shooter. I would have thought it was better than that. Deron Lamb was their best three-point shooter at 47%. But, you know, they had Davis inside, and they had that inside-outside game, which, I mean, goodness gracious, that team's like 30 years ago, the way the game has changed since then. But t- to me, that style of basketball probably behooved better three-point shooting because you had a back-to-the-basket guy in the paint. And then you had to worry about the kickouts. And so some of that between that and maybe just, well, the three-point line's been moved back, right? Yeah. And so that has to have an effect. Although you see these guys shoot it from 25, and it looks effortless. And and maybe uh, maybe it's harder than they make it look (laughs) at times. But I I do think there's some style elements that are probably in play and in some rule changes as well. Yeah, I agree. And that is something you have to keep in mind. The line's been moved back and we really saw, I mean, we saw the, the numbers on that last season, you know, just kind of seeing how, how much it can affect teams. And um, so that's something I think as you get adjusted, but I think as players get more adjusted to it, and uh, again, you're always going to have your sharpshooters. Guys are going to be able to shoot from five feet behind the line, no matter where it's at. Uh, But uh, that is something that, that I still think, you know, for Alabama, I mean, a team that, you know, shoots as many threes and, and gets as many of their points from the three point line as you can. It's it's simple arithmetic uh, for the the math teacher Nate Oates. Uh, three points are worth more than two, and uh, if you can get you know guys that can shoot at a very high level and be able to score consistently three points versus the other team scoring two points, uh, at the end of the day, you're still going to have a little bit of an edge somewhere in there. Uh, so I I do think that's such a big element, and, and again for teams like Vanderbilt, even a team like Texas A and M, you know I think for them like if they can just find someone that that could be just that knockdown shooter type um, that would be able to improve their offensive numbers too. So it plays such a big role in the game for sure. Okay. Here's a trivia question for you. And I'll be astonished if you did this <laughs> first college game with the three point line was when who played and how long was the distance? Not a clue. I couldn't even give you one of the, one of the four or three. So I don't think I would have gotten within three decades of this. Uh, This is according to Wikipedia. The three-point line was first tested at the collegiate level in 1945 with a 21-foot line in a game between Columbia and Fordham, but was not kept as a rule. Mm. Uh, Now, what I remember is in the 80s, the ACC was the first league to use the line, and they put it at 17-9, which now seems like a free throw almost. Uh, I'm shocked that I don't remember a lot of teams – just bombing it away from three then, I, I think that it took a while. Like you saw this in the SEC. I think uh, Sam Newton at Vandy was one of the first guys to really adjust his style of play and figure out the benefit uh, of that. But it, it seemed like there was a lag between the line coming into play and teams figuring out really how big of a weapon it could be. Yeah, I think so. And and again, I think the teams that acclimated quicker – 
as you said, you were able to kind of, you know, set yourself apart at times if you could acclimate to playing that different style. And, and, and we've just seen, you know, again, going back to just how the game has evolved, it's, it's become such a different game. And, um, I think just, uh, you know, teams that can add in that element and, uh, try to get those guys that the shooters are, are very valuable still in, in this day and age. You know, I think we, we certainly look at the recruiting and the five stars and all this other stuff and, uh, man, if you can just find it doesn't care if it doesn't matter if a guy's a one star, a two star, a three star, if he can knock down four or five threes a game, um, then then that just that that adds a different dimension to your offense. And I think there's a lot of teams around the SEC, a lot of teams around the country uh, that would love to have uh, guys like that right now. Well, I think the recruiting Raiders do a pretty good job of evaluating talent and four stars and five stars. But I do wonder sometimes if shooting has gotten a little bit undervalued throughout the history of online recruiting rankings, which is about 20 years now. Yeah, I agree. I think it's something where, I don't know, I almost feel like, um, and look, I'm like you said, it. I'm, I'm not someone that could be as great as that as, as all these guys are that, that kind of survey talent and determine those, those rankings and ratings and all that. But um, I, I do think that's just, that's one element that, if you can just find a guy like that, that's, you know, again, it, it may, maybe isn't someone that is going to translate to the NBA level where if you're rating these guys and you're doing it on, okay, this guy's going to be great in college, but man, he's really got that ability to get to that next level and be an NBA star. Um, you don't necessarily have to have that. I mean, you just, you know, there, there are elements to every team. And I think when we, we break down what is a great team, like, I don't think we're usually just talking about one guy that's just a can't miss guy like there were like okay this guy's great he's yeah he's going to the nba but man what about this guy who gets all their you know defensive rebounds what about this one guy who can hit six threes in a game um what about this guy who's their defensive stopper it's just you know basketball is what it is i mean it's a it's a team game where i think for the teams that go the furthest it's usually not just one guy who's able to do everything um you have to have different elements and and i think having you know a point guard a defensive stopper a shooter those are all things that go into to making kind of the, the best teams that we see in the game. Well, here's where I think it's hard if you're a talent evaluator. And I don't know what the answer is, okay? But is a is a four-star player, a high four-star, is that a kid who comes in, plays at a marginal level for a year, or is an okay player, maybe a, a, a third-best player on his team type, but good enough with the athleticism to get to the NBA or is a four-star player, a kid who maybe is developmental. And by the time he plays his junior and senior year, he's a conference player of the year candidate. Um, yeah. I don't know what the answer is, but to me, it seems like a lot of this is set up around what's pro potential. And let's say that you, you rate a guy, a high four star and he comes in and, and he plays say at Mississippi state and he averages, I don't know, 9.7 rebounds a game shoots 40% from the field, but there's an athletic component there that makes him good enough to be a late first round or early second round and he goes. Is that a hit or a miss as a recruiting analyst? Yeah, I, I think, I don't know, and maybe I'm not, and I don't think everyone's this way, but I think when we see those five, when we see the five stars beside someone's name, I feel like in basketball at least, our first thing is, okay, that guy's probably going to the NBA. Like, and we don't know, you know, in what form or fashion, whether it's after one year or two years or whatever, I think our first thought is he's going to be able to play in the NBA, not he's going to be able to, you know, I don't think we're we're not looking at it all the time just from a college standpoint. I think, uh, for my mind at least, I feel like I'm like, okay, well, this guy's probably got the potential to be in the NBA. Um, maybe he's a one and done. Um, and I think it's just, you know, the numbers probably just kind of look at what you've seen from guys over the years that have been rated that highly and you say, okay, well, this guy made the jump after one year or two years or whatever. And so uh, it is, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I always go back to the, and this is a little bit of a different discussion, but, you know, that Tennessee team several years ago uh, with Grant Williams and, and Schofield and, and all those other guys, you know, none of those guys were, were to that level. And, you know, at one point in the season, they got to being the number one team in the country and, and probably should have went further than they did in the NCAA tournament. But, you know, it had nothing to do with with the star ratings. It just sort of, I think, player development. We mentioned that on the last podcast too. Um, throw it all out the window. If you can develop players, um, I think that that is something that is a very top valuable skill because that is, I, I think, for the most part, you know, that is going to give you the best opportunity. I feel like to to make the most strides as a program long term 
than it is to just be able to base it off the the star ratings uh, and just knowing that you know a five star that comes in and doesn't play like a five star is he actually a five star like those those are the kind of questions and you know play on words that we have all the time but uh, I just think it's a fascinating discussion. Okay, that team in particular, I know that Grant Williams and Admiral Schofield were probably the best two players on the team. And when I say that team, I'm talking about the 2018-19 Tennessee team that went 31-6 and and got to the Sweet 16 before it got beat in overtime by Purdue. I mean, that that was a really good team with a lot of good players. You also had Jordan Bone, Jordan Bowden, Lamonte Turner, and then some guys that contributed at a lesser level Kyle Alexander and uh, John Fulkerson and Eves Ponds, although those latter two were not really serious contributors on that team because of those other kids. But I think that, um, was it Bowden or Bone? I think it was Bone was maybe the only rival's top 150 kid so. on that team. I mean, yeah. I know Williams' offers, I think, and this is from memory, it may be wrong. He had interest from the Ivy League yep. and maybe some Colonial League type schools. Yeah. Uh, Schofield, I don't remember specifically who his offers were, but he was not that highly regarded. Now, that is a needle that Rick Barnes threaded, although a lot of those were Donnie Tindall's recruits. I don't know that we'll see that again in our lifetime because the odds of hitting with those guys to the degree that he hit. And and it's one thing to say a five-star recruit now versus one, say, in the 80s or the 90s when there weren't online recruiting services and you just had a couple people who did it. And, you know, I honestly, I don't know how much they could go out and see players compared to the way analysts do. So I, I think that, boy, doing that now in this day and age where there's a lot of eyeballs on kids and a lot of video out there, I don't know that we'll see that again. Well, and, and I talk about the player development aspect of it. The, the problem is, too, like the, the business has changed to where I can completely understand that if you're, you know, there's a reason everybody's chasing the five stars and the four stars because, you know, technically, if they're, you know, you put your stock into into these services, the guys who do this for a living, they're the best players. And the best players give you the best chance to have the most success right away. Uh, it's it's much easier to to kind of keep your job and, and be able to uh, move upward in the coaching profession if you can do that quicker because you don't have the situations anymore for the most part where you're afforded, you know, four years to be able to develop your guys from freshman to senior. And let's say, you know, that freshman, sophomore, senior, or excuse me, freshman, sophomore, junior group, you know, they win eight games a year. Um, maybe you, you turn around and win 20 games in that fourth year, but it's like, you know, sometimes a lot of guys don't get that fourth year. And so it's, um, it's something too, where I think that that certainly plays a role to where player development isn't always the answer because, um, for the most part, this has become such a tough business and the competitiveness is at an all time high in terms of, especially in the sec, um, where you've got coaches everywhere that have been to a final four, a lead eight, anything like that. Sometimes you don't always get the time to be able to develop those guys. And with the transfer too, I mean, my goodness, that, that adds another element, doesn't it? Because, um, you got guys transferring in and out. It's just a, it's a different game. And, and I think we're seeing that, uh, and, and a lot of pre, a lot of programs just have to adjust to it. So. Yeah. Good example there, or, or maybe it's an awful example because there was an 0 18 in there. And of course included the Darius Garland injury, which was a, a real game changer for that program. I mean, that Vanderbilt team, Three years ago, I don't know that it was going to the NCAA tournament. I think it probably was. They had some defensive issues. But with Garland in there, they had some big wins. You know, they beat Liberty, a really good Liberty team at home, and beat Arizona State after they lost him because they still had some other talent around. But Bryce Drew got three years at Vanderbilt, a place that is as patient with coaches as anybody. And I I guess on that topic, the name I'm kind of wondering about is Tom Crean. Yeah, because Georgia last year had the number one, you know, a, a number one draft pick type in Anthony Anthony Edwards. Uh, they go five and thirteen in the league with him. He's gone five and eight this year with the young team that's promising. But you go back to, first of all, you, you go back to his season where he started. He's two and sixteen, and so now he's a lot of games underwater in the league, right? And then you throw in the fact that we've talked about this in other episodes. The league is really good. I mean, I think the floor for teams in this league is is pretty high. You've got a lot of teams that, you know, when you're looking at your 11th or 12th place team in the league, it's a, it's a borderline NIT team. That's a tough place to be in as a conference because there aren't a lot of easy wins. And the further you slide down that ladder, which is kind of the territory the Queen's in at Georgia, 
This is the discussion that we had the other day about Jerry Stackhouse. I see Tom Crean is sort of in that same boat to where, okay, what what happens if the, this season ends four or five games under 500? I don't know if if he can look at it and say, hey, look, we've got a lot of, of guys coming back next year uh, who were promising players, and, and we see better things ahead. I think that argument is easier to make some years than it might be next year where you've got Auburn, maybe Mississippi State, uh, several other teams that are kind of in that same boat, Blake. Think about this. I, I just did this in my head, but I was I, I now I feel like we know this subconsciously, but when you actually think about it, the top teams in the SEC right now, Alabama, if you go down the SEC standings, Alabama, Arkansas, LSU, Florida, um, Missouri, Ole Miss. You've got Tennessee grouped in there. So of the top, let's see, that's going to be six of seven. So the top six out of the seven teams in the SEC, the one thing they have in common is that none of those coaches have been to a Final Four. Rick Barnes has been there, and he's he's got the team that's in the fifth spot right now. Think about all the coaches that are below that group. The six out of the top seven have not been to a Final Four yet. Yet, Calipari's been there. Kentucky's down there. Auburn, Bruce Pearl's been there, down there. Ben Howland, Mississippi State, down there. Tom Crean, Georgia, down there. South Carolina, Frank Martin, down there. Like, this is what I mean. Like, this, the, the coaching roster in the SEC, where you're seeing the, the guys who haven't, haven't been to a Final Four, all of a sudden they've shifted their programs up to the top. The guys who have been there, and look, I know it's different. Some of the guys, it's, it's been a while since they've been there. But still, that's not an easy accomplishment. These are guys that have gotten these jobs because – they have won a lot of games in their careers. They've had a lot of success. But like these are the guys that have been the furthest in terms of just the NCAA tournament. I know it's a random event. We always talk about it, matchups, all that. But like in a year like this, I mean, it's not going to be this way every season, but it's like like those are the guys you're competing against. Like the it's you know, we all of a sudden you've got these programs that have gone to the top to where these are like the up and coming coaches that are, you know, competing against these guys who've been to Final Fours, Elite Eights, all that. And it's just like, it's so hard to jump above that next tier to where you are. And, and once you do bottom out as a program, which we thought Vanderbilt did, and we've seen other SEC teams do over the years, I mean, it's just, man, it is so hard to make that jump back up in a very short amount of time because it's just not easy to do given the state of the league right now. Oh, okay. Let's go a little further. Texas A&M, Buzz Williams was the SEC coach of the year last right. year, which yeah. I'd, I'd already forgotten. <laughs> yeah. um, Buzz Williams has been doing lead eight at Marquette, right? Yep. Uh, yep. Tom Crean won how many Big Ten titles? Was yep. it two or three? He, I mean, the, the fact is, I don't know how many it was, but if people remember exactly what that Indiana program looked like when he took over and when, you know, I think that's something you always have to keep in mind too. I don't think he necessarily got – credit he deserved at times there because my goodness that program when he took over it was not in a good spot yeah i mean ben Howland went to the the title game what once or twice um I been say, to the final four a couple times i want to say that they, they get there that year where it was all one seeds i can't remember that feels like forever ago but I, they I know lost to florida one year that's I right that. yeah um so you know tom we talked about cream frank martin's been to a final four had a really good run of success at kansas state uh, bruce pearl has been to a Final Four, um, you know, and had Tennessee consistently year yeah. in and year out a top 25 team for a while. I mean, just the list goes on and on. You you could look at every school in this league right now, and they are either having NCAA tournament caliber success or really close to it. Kind of the in-between right now is Ole Miss, right? Because yeah. Ole Miss needs to win a couple more games, or Kermit Davis had some postseason success of his own at Middle Tennessee State, but you look, Auburn, Mississippi State, Georgia, South Carolina, A&M, bottom half of the league teams, all those teams have a coach who's got some significant hardware on his resume at other stops. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Like, again, five of the, what is it? Yeah, five of the bottom seven teams right now, which we we, we will admit, like Kentucky, we know it's not going to be there every year, but like five of the bottom seven have coaches that have been to a final four. So it's just, um, that's, that's the conference right now. And, and Hey, I guess we could say this too, though, right? Like give credit to Alabama and Arkansas because Hey, they made the right hires, didn't they? At least right now it looks like they did because, um, there was very important hires for those guys, you know, before last season we said, Hey, 
you've got to get this right. And this is what we said with all these coaching hires, A&M, which like we said, I mean, they got it right too, because he was coach of the year last year. Um, you know, long-term success. We'll see how that turns out. But as of right now, it looks like, you know, for those two in particular, the two teams that are sitting right there at the top, Alabama and Arkansas, um, you know, they, they got it right, at least for now, because um, the, these coaches figured out what you had to do coming into this league to have success and, and they're having it. So. Okay, I'm going to ask you this. This just popped into my head, so I don't know that I have a great answer. I think I have an answer. I don't know if it's the right one, but I'll be interested to hear how you think through this, Blake. Biggest wild card program over the next five years in the SEC is who? In other words, the range of outcomes that you just really have the hardest time grasping on where this program is heading. Oh, boy. Um, I... Hmm. That's a good question. I will probably say that I think it's going to be LSU <clears throat> because I think of the situation going on and, and you know, this whole NCAA, all that stuff. I think it, it, I'll say that because I think it could have the widest range because let's say, you know, let's say Will Wade were to get fired or something. Um, you know, what what the potential ramifications are for the program if something comes of, of whatever the NCAA decides or whatever decisions are made, you know, that could set the program back a little bit. So I think if if nothing happens, like if nothing happens, I don't think LSU's going anywhere. I think LSU's going to be a top five SEC team for quite honestly, probably as long as he's there. I mean, I think he's a he's a good basketball coach. Um and so I, I think that's the thing for me is if we're talking about wide range of possibilities where a team could be at the top or could go all the way down near the bottom, if something, you know, if, if this team a or B or whatever, like these, these things happen. Um, I think they have the widest range in terms of where they could be maybe in the next five years. I've, I had a different answer and I think I like yours better than mine. And it's for a couple of reasons. First of all, LSU has had a, just an exceptionally wide range of outcomes. Yeah. Probably more than any program in the conference on a year to year basis. I'm trying to find a list of seasons as we go to back this up with numbers, but you can go back for the last 20 or 25 years and find several times that LSU was the worst team in the league one year and the best the next. I mean, I've not seen a program that has had the swings of highs and lows within a one-year, two-year period. And this is all off the top of my head, but I'd be surprised if I'm wrong the way that that one has. And frankly, it goes back probably further than that. And I know in the 70s, LSU was borderline national power under Dale Brown and, and really into the 80s, although as he got better players, uh, the quality of the product uh, was... You know, they had Shaquille O'Neal, Chris Jackson, Stanley Roberts, and those teams never got anywhere near the heights I think a lot of people thought they would for the talent they had. And and then you go back and look to complicate things further. He had that Final Four team he had, I think, in 84, uh, where they were maybe an 11 or 12 seed, I don't remember, and, and kind of got on a run. And that that was not a very talented team. It was That was the Don Redden team who, who ended up dying later. But, yeah, I mean, you had some years. I think, okay, it was 86, and they were an 11 seed, to, to be exact. I'm starting to ramble here, and I do apologize. But, first of all, you have a program that has had a history of just these crazy ups and downs, literally going from the best to the worst uh, in, in within a season or two. Number two, you, you have the probation layer, but I think that's also, or potential probation, that's also complicated by the fact that I think everybody thinks this name, in, image, and likeness thing is going to gain more momentum before it gains less, and all of a sudden the things that get teams on probation now uh, and, and get you on the, the really bad kind of probation are going to be perfectly legal here in a few years. I will be interested to see how, as this drags on, and then the NCAA approves certain things and lets kids get paid, Okay, then how does the NCAA legislate out a punishment? Because on one hand, it's going to be saying, okay, we have no problem with kids getting paid for the use of their image. It's now legal, but then you go back and you punish LSU 
because could kids took advantage of that. I, I wonder how that is going to play out as well. Yeah, I think it's, um, for, for whatever reason, I still think this is a long road, like in terms of what actual decisions are made, because uh, it feels like this thing's been going on forever. And, and I don't even, again, we, we talked about it on one of the episodes of the podcast. I can't even remember when this thing actually started. Uh, it feels, I don't even know what the year was at this point. It just feels like it's, it's dragged on forever. And um, I think at this point, everyone's just like, I don't even know. Like, like I really don't like it's, um, it's a situation that I have no idea how it's going to fall, but I am curious, like who, who, who would have been your pick as the other, because I know you had someone different in mind than LSU. So, so who would you have said would be your, your initial pick? I was going to go Texas A&M. That's fair. I think. Yeah. Because I think Buzz Williams has done great things at every stop, uh, but that's just not a place where they have won at the level that a lot of other programs in the league have. The, the other one might be Florida. Yeah, I thought about because Florida. Think, yeah, because I think Mike White is a really good coach, and he was very good. You know, Louisiana Tech was kind of an underrated story. I mean, they never made the NCAA tournament, but he'd win 26, 27 games. And I know people can say a Conference USA or whatever, but you know, when you're in a particular league, you, you're sort of lumped in with the other schools in terms of recruiting base and and, the, and resources and those sorts of things. So... I look a lot at, at how you do in your league compared to your peers, and he had a really good record there. Uh, you know, this year I wonder this was a Final Four team if, if Keontae Johnson doesn't get hurt. I mean, they've done they've done really well, and I think White, I believe they got to the lead eight a couple of years back, if I remember correctly, under him. So he's been good, uh, but that's one that you go back and look at what they did under Billy Donovan when they had the back to back national titles and. You know, you say there's a program that's got a ceiling there. Uh, White, White hasn't quite met that, to say the least, but he also has had some really good teams, too. I would also, I think, throw South Carolina in the discussion. Um, I have zero inside information here, and this is not me you know, rumoring or reporting anything, but I don't know that I can see Frank Martin staying at South Carolina. Um for for the uh, much I don't I don't even know what the year I don't even know what the frame would be the time frame, uh, but I feel like maybe as the years go along for him there, I don't know. Do do you think in the back of his mind he's got to be wondering you know what what is the next step here because he's already got him to a final four he's done something that's never been done there for for the program ever before he could have he could probably have that job for as long as he wants it because he got him to the final four but. That's not an easy place to win. And, you know, when you can ask coaches who have come through there for over the years, whether it's, um, you know, Darren Horn, Eddie Fogler, like go, go through everybody. That's, that's not an easy place to win traditionally. Um, and, and look, they've, they've been up and down. South Carolina's been up and down as a whole. But, you know, making that tournament run, I have to wonder if eventually, you know, let's say some other jobs open up. Um, let's say a Jim Laranega retires at Miami. I could see Frank Mark going to Miami. I could see him taking that job over that. And you can play the game all you want about what's the better job. But if you talk about recruiting base and all this other stuff, um, you know, I think that's something I would also think in the back of my mind is if Frank Martin decided to leave South Carolina, whenever that is, um, I, I think there's a there's a wide range of possibilities as to where that program could go from there, because, um, you know, he is someone that for the most part has sort of kept them, as we say, they may lose some head scratchers in non-conference play, but he's really kept them in that you know, half top half tier for the most part in the SEC um, in terms of conference play and all that uh, for pretty much, you know, since he's been there for a little while. So. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Frank Martin is only 54, so he's not yeah. that old. And of course, Miami is where he's from. Uh, you know, and his recruiting base has been just a lot of Europe. And I mean, those are, those are hard recruiting battles, right? That's, yeah. I mean, you're talking travel and, and God knows what else there. You know, you put him, because I, I don't think Frank is a guy that you don't see South Carolina in the mix for a lot of McDonald's All Americans, but and I don't know how big the Latino basketball community is, but I would think that like you put him in that backyard, and this is like this is completely off the cuff. We have no information that Frank Martin's going to be right. Miami's ex basketball coach or anything. So before we get too far out ahead, let's just make that clear. But yeah, I mean, I could see circumstances where with the right place that happens. The other thing about him, you look at his career, right? He is at schools where basketball is second place, like Kansas State, 
Uh, I would say it's second place to football, you know, at this point, given the success Bill Snyder had. Certainly South Carolina, that's the case. So, you know, maybe you look for places like that that fit, because I don't think that, and, and ask Nate Oates, I don't think that being in a school where you can have pretty significant success in basketball, but it's not the focus of things. You know, when you've got a yeah. big football program like Alabama does, I think a lot of times those kind of jobs maybe tend to be a little bit underrated. It's funny you say that. I just did a little research because I, I've seen this somewhere before, and, and I've probably heard this on podcasts. I don't know if it's necessarily been like in a written article online, but I've heard the Frank Martin Miami like stuff. And I think, again, that's just that's probably analysts, reporters tying things together like we just did and saying, okay, well, he's from there and certainly would make sense. Um, you know, if he ever wanted to leave South Carolina, um, obviously that would probably be a job he would think about. I found this message board. It's from a Florida 24-7 sports message board from 2011. So this is a post from April 2011. Uh, and look, we have no idea if this is factual or not because I am reading this straight from the message board and we know how that goes. And Chris can tell you how the message boards work sometimes. Um, Gary Parrish of CBS Sports reports, that Frank Martin would walk over a bed of hot coals to take the Miami job if Miami will commit the resources to its basketball program. That is pretty much the basis of this post, and, and obviously there are a lot of replies from there. So that that goes into it. So, I mean, I, I think that's something you have to think about because, um, you know, it is. It's about the basketball versus football, and, you know, in the SEC, that was always the conversation is, well, you know, Alabama, are they going to be able to hire a good basketball coach because there's so much emphasis on football? Auburn, the same way. Well, we've seen what's happened, you know, with Nate Oates and, and Bruce Pearl. So I, I think that's uh, something that you can debunk as long as uh, the actual school itself uh, puts forth the resources to commit to the basketball program, which is something that, not ha that doesn't happen everywhere. So, Yeah, as someone who's run a message board, I will tell you that sometimes the the crazy truth out of the blue that gets posted. There's <laughs> right. more to it than people think. <laughs> yes. Uh, not, not, not always by any 10 years time, ago. But... Think about that. That's from 10 years ago. So uh, that was a long time. And that would have been like, he would have still been at Kansas state at that point. Right. So, I mean, I have to feel, I have to feel that that was like at a point where I don't even remember again, this, it all runs together at this point, but um, that, that was probably a discussion that was had a, a decade ago. So. Well, Jim Lirinaga is 71 and frankly looks at, and is seven and twelve this year. I mean, at some point that's got to come to an end. Uh, he's had now this will be his third straight losing season if things play out the way they have. So I don't know. That that's interesting. I mean, that, that was kind of a shot in the dark there, but that might be one to watch. Well, guess what? If Jim Jim Leonega left Miami and took an SEC job, we'd have another coach that's been to a Final Four. So replace one with another. So my goodness. Well, you already had one coaching change in that conference yesterday, one coach firing yep. Yep. at Boston College, so uh, yeah. just as an aside. So, you know, we were going to get into Player of the Year talk today, <laughs> uh, but I think we'll save that one for another episode. Yeah, this was I, I thought this was a lot of fun because uh, we, we pretty much, uh, I think, broke down the entire state of SEC basketball, both in numbers, coaches, uh, rosters, recruits. Like, we, I think we, we got a lot accomplished here in an hour, so. You know what the weird thing about this podcast is? And we've been going for uh, about two weeks now, more or less. We've probably talked less Kentucky basketball <laughs> than any of the 13 schools, and that's not intentional. It just sort of is what it is. Well, I got nothing against Kentucky, but I'll tell you one thing. Us not covering Kentucky, I can promise you there's plenty of coverage out there. If you uh, if you want some Kentucky basketball coverage, uh, you will not uh, have a hard time finding it probably uh, if you just want that specific team because, man, there is a uh, little bit of coverage of that program. So, Yeah, there is. And, again, part of what we're here for is to, to be the, the filling in of that donut hole, right? I mean, football gets covered a lot at just about every angle. Basketball gets covered, certainly at the Kentucky angle. And if you've got a program that's hitting it in a stretch like Alabama and Auburn have, coverage picks up at those schools. Although you listen to people in that state and they say basketball is still undercover down there. But, but the point is, what we want to do here is try to talk about a lot of things that I think are interesting topics. And I mean, you're looking at tens of thousands of fans who I think have interest in the things that we're going to talk about uh, between basketball and baseball, and of course football too. We're just we're further off from football season, and so that's not what's happening right now, and that's where our attention is going to be. But I think that 
that's what we're here for is to hit the things that I think we don't think deserve or that we think deserve coverage and don't get hit a lot of other places. And I think if you like that kind of coverage, you're going to love what we have to offer here at the podcast. And by the way, the website, which is going to get launched any day now, from what I understand. Yeah, I, I think that's going to certainly, as we said, that'll add another element to the stuff we do. But but I also wanted to add to what you said is, you know, I, I think we all, like, if we're if you're someone that's a fan of an SEC team, you, you live inside the SEC bubble to an extent. Uh, but, you know, we also know, like, out, there's stuff outside of the SEC that sometimes ties into the SEC in some way, shape, or form. Like, I'm sure, Chris, whenever we talk about the NCAA tournament, we'll probably be talking about some other stuff going on in the tournament instead of just what's going on with particular SEC teams. Because if your team makes a run, you're going to have to think ahead to like, okay, well, who could we play and all this other stuff. So I think there's always stuff like that. And, and that's what I think makes the conversation a lot of fun, like we said, because there's just so many different tie-ins. And, you know, it's just, I don't know. You, you look at the background just to, of the league as a whole, of, of the coaches, of just the rosters. Like there's just there's so many fun elements to this, whether it's basketball, baseball, football. And so, uh, yeah, we, we've got, we're going to have it all covered and uh, it's a lot of fun to do. So, yeah, we will be all over the NCAA tournament bubble and where teams will be seated and that kind of stuff in the coming weeks. And Blake, tell folks where they can follow us online, where they can get our podcast. But by, by the way, I asked that people would please rate and review those. That really helps us. But Give out the info that people need to follow here, Blake. Yeah, uh, you can uh, check out the podcast as uh, we've talked about on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere. It's on Stitcher now. It's pretty much getting to all of the the individual podcast apps. So if you use a a third party app, uh, I think like Pocket Casts or Overcast or any of those, um, it should be on there now. So just search for the fourteen or Southeastern 14, you'll be able to find it uh, either way there. And uh, we'll have a YouTube channel. You can just uh, search for it on YouTube too. And we'll have the links to all of this stuff once we have the website up, as Chris mentioned, should be any time now. Uh, we'll have all the links also on our Twitter, at 14 Southeastern. Um, so you can find any of the links you need uh, to get this, subscribe to it each day. And then, as we said, we really are excited about the, the website, and we'll have more written stuff for, for everyone as well. So uh, lots of places to check out everything we have going on at the 14. Well, and we promise you baseball coverage is coming uh, as soon as the U.S. Postal Service cooperates a little <laughs> bit. No no shade meant there. It's difficult conditions right now uh, for a lot of shipping agencies. But in any case, that is going to be coming very soon. Goodness gracious, first pitch three days away as, as we do this. And I'm just really looking forward to that, although I wonder how much is going to be canceled. I think Kentucky has already had its first series canceled which is a disappointment but but anyway we will have that covered we will have podcasts coming up uh, we do these five days a week so we will drop episodes wednesday thursday and friday thank you for listening to the 14 and we'll catch you again tomorrow